Roger said the second half. I don't know if the second half will be a half because that means we're here real late, but we'll, we'll see what the energy is and what we can accomplish yet in our time remaining. So that was a pause and we're back to the third of the three key New Testament texts, all from the Apostle Paul. And you can see again from the slide that the Romans text is the most important one because it's longer than the other two. Two, because it deals not just with same-sex male activity, but also same-sex female activity. And most importantly, Paul gives an argumentation. He gives a reason why he claims that, that same-sex activity is inappropriate for followers of Jesus. So here we go. Here is the Romans text, and it's a little longer, and I do know that there are important words before these verses and afterwards, but these give us at least the heart of the most important verses. So Romans 1, beginning of verse 24. Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual immorality for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is to be praised forever. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchange natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. So, revisionists. These are uh, people who think that the church needs to revise or change its traditional uh, view on same-sex activity, they, they tend to argue on this Romans passage with two kinds of arguments. So I want you to be prepared for two kinds of claims that are often made about the Romans text, right? So this isn't me. This is me, right, uh, summarizing the kind of argument that is often made. So, so one common claim about the Romans text is Paul here isn't talking about normal desire, normal sexual desire. He's talking about excessive, abnormal, exorbitant, out of control sexual desire for which we have a convenient word called lust. And that means that, that Paul in this passage, again, is not against all forms of same-sex activity. He's just against some forms of same-sex activity. He's against excessive, lust-filled, out-of-controlled forms of same-sex activity. He would be okay, he would tolerate, he would accept monogamous, long-term same-sex activity. At least that is the claim that is often made. So how do we respond to that? Two responses. So the word for desire Right? I want you to know that the word for desire isn't always a negative word. In fact, in another letter, Paul uses the word desire to describe his desire to go back to them. Paul says to the Thessalonians, I have a desire, I have a passion to come back and see you. And then when Paul wants to show that this passion, this desire is really big, right? Paul says, it wasn't like I just kind of wanted to come to you. Paul says, I, I greatly, greatly had a burning passion to come back and see you. He, he can say that by adding a little word in English called much. So, so Paul says, I, didn't, I, don't, I just don't want to come back to see you. I, I have much desire to come back and see you. So the point I'm trying to make, and maybe not so well, it hits me, is that is that if, if Paul in Romans, if Paul in Romans, so the argument says, is against excessive passion, excessive desire, for which we happen to have the English word lust, he could have easily used that same Greek word much. Paul could have simply said, there were men who have not just desire for other men, they have much desire for other men, because that's what he does in another letter. But Paul doesn't do that in Romans, and so that suggests, again, that Paul is maybe not against excessive desire of men for other men. Maybe he's just against normal desire of men for other men or women for other men. And so that excessive point is not so uh, significant as it may first seem. But here's another very important argument. I think this one it will be uh, more clear to you. And it picks up something I said earlier. Oh boy, it might be dangerous to say, can you remember the first half? 
the first half where I said, if you're a Jew, you, you have these two typical Gentile sins. Does that sound familiar to you? Do you remember that? And what are the two Gentile sins? One is, we know Jews, we know that Gentiles are guilty of idolatry, right? Unlike us who worship one God, they worship many gods, idolatry. And the second one was sexual immorality, okay? So it's not surprising that in Romans, the text we're looking at, Paul talks about exactly those same two sins. Because in chapter 1, everyone agrees that Paul is highlighting in Rome, first, the Gentile Christians. So in chapter 1, Paul is addressing the Gentile Christians and trying to make the point that they're all guilty. They've all fallen short. They're all sinful. In fact, Paul is so strong on the Gentiles in chapter 1 that the Jewish Christians, they were Jewish Christians in Rome, probably felt kind of good about themselves until Paul got to chapter 2. Oh, because then he said, now you Jews, you're no better. And in fact, by the time he gets to 3.23, you know that verse, he says, "For, for there is no difference, right? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory. See, there's no difference between Jewish Christians and Gentiles. So in chapter 1, he's highlighting the first of those two groups within the Roman churches. He's talking about Gentile Christians, and he's saying those same two sins, idolatry and sexual morality. And one form of sexual morality would be same-sex activity. Now, if you know that, that's really important for knowing what's going on in uh, chapter 1. It is not occasion of excess. Think of the logic for a minute. So, so in the first part of Romans, Paul talks about Gentiles who are guilty of idolatry. Now, is Paul going to say to the Gentiles, some idolatry is okay, but excessive idolatry, out of control out of idolatry, that's bad. Paul would never say that. Paul would say any form of idolatry is bad, okay? And so now when he gets to the next part and he starts talking about sexual immorality, particularly same-sex activity, Paul is not going to say, now, Normal same-sex activity is okay, but excessive, out of control, that's bad. Don't you see? Just like a little bit of idolatry is bad, so also a little bit of same-sex activity is bad. It isn't one of excessive, out of control. It's just inappropriate behavior, whether in small or large amounts. And so the argument of of Paul being okay with normal same-sex desire, but just against excessive same-sex desire... Uh, doesn't work when you look at the argument more closely. Well, there's a second argument that is often made, and this is an important one to get right too. Now, Paul uh, says that same-sex activity is bad because these are people who are acting, now in Greek, parafusen, it means against their nature, against their nature. Now, This may sound a little bit confusing, but some revisionists want to say, and they combine it with the first argument, Paul, they would say Paul is not against same-sex people following their desires. He's just against, as we said, excessive. So if I'm a heterosexual, right, it's okay if okay, so my nature is I want to have sex with women, but wait a minute, I'm I'm so filled with passion that instead of having sex with women, I have sex with men. But they argue. If I'm a homosexual and I have a nature, I have a desire for other, if I'm homosexual, a desire for other men, okay, I want to make sure you're with me, right? That's okay too, but I'm so filled with lust that even though I, by nature, I want to have sex with other men, I'm so filled with lust, I have sex with other women. You see, that's, and the same thing, if I'm a lesbian, I, by nature, have a desire for other Women, okay, Paul says, that's no problem. But wait a minute, so they say, if you're so filled with passion, excessive desire, instead of having sex as a woman with another woman, according to your nature, you act against your nature and you have sex with a man. Okay, you, you see, it's kind of a clever, rather sophisticated argument, and, uh, and yet that's the claim that's often made. So how do we evaluate that? Well, most people, most scholars agree that when Paul talks about nature, acting against nature, he's talking about acting against your what nature? Your created nature. Your created nature. In other words, did, did you hear it? Did you hear it? I mean, when I read the Romans, did you, the text, did you hear Paul echoing the creation story of Genesis 1 and 2? Did you hear it? <laughs> 
You missed it, did you? Oh, is it possible? I mean, does Paul know the Old Testament? Does he know the creation story? The answer is yes, okay, right? And, and, and well, let's look in the text and see if there are any clues, if there are any clues in Romans 1 that he's actually thinking of the creation story. So when you look at the verses, let's see what it says. So Romans 1.20, that's four verses earlier, Paul, four verses earlier, that's part of the context, Paul says, for since the what? Since the creation of the world. Boy, it sounds like he's thinking about the creation. I just want to spell it out for you, okay? Go 123, one verse beforehand. He has these three words, these three nouns in a row, birds and animals and reptiles, and these same three terms occur exactly in Genesis 1, right? The creation story. 125, that's found right in the middle of the verses I read to you. You missed it, didn't you? I know you missed it, because I missed it too, until you got to slow down, right? And look more carefully. So how did Paul refer to God in those verses? He didn't refer to God as God. He didn't refer to God as Father. No, he referred to God as? I mean, you know, it sounds to me that he's thinking about creation. Okay, I mean, that's not a stretch, is it? I mean, and then we keep going in 125 and 126. So there's a common word for, for a man and a woman. And then there's a, I won't say a rare word, but a more technical word, more uniquely referring to a male versus a woman. And exactly these two words that Paul uses in these two verses of Romans 1 occur also in the creation story. In fact, some of us know this. I don't know if we know it from marriage ceremonies, but, but we know that phrase, male and female, God, he created them. And that's why really all Roman scholars believe that in chapter 1, where these verses occur, Paul is echoing, he's in his mind, he's thinking about the creation story. And why is that important? Because when he talks about people acting against their nature, you ought to understand that their what nature? Their created nature, right? So in other words, Paul disagrees with same-sex activity because from Paul's point of view, men and women were uniquely created for each other. And so when a man has sex with another man, he's acting against his nature, his created nature. And when a woman has sex with another woman, he, she is acting against her created nature. And this is important because, again, here we hear Paul not just saying that that activity is wrong, but he's giving you the reason why, right? He says that such activity is against nature. That's what he literally says. But what he means when you see those references to the creation story it means that he's talking about acting against their created nature. Now, let's imagine that you're here tonight and you're viewing me with some skepticism. You're looking at me and, and you're skeptical about what I say, not because I'm a Calvinist, but because, you know, you think I'm like this ultra-conservative scholar who is distorting the biblical evidence, and you're saying to yourself, I'm sure there's some other egghead New Testament people who come in and, and explain these texts quite differently, all right? I know that some of you are thinking about that. So, so what am I going to say to you? So I'm going to bring in two voices that maybe you might find persuasive, okay? Two other voices, and I have to explain who these voices are so that you'll find them persuasive. So the first one is a guy named William Loder. Who is William Loder? He's like me. He's a New Testament scholar, and he's from Australia. Okay, he's a little older than I am. But he's not like me in the sense that he's a true liberal. In other words, he, I'm not just accusing him of being a liberal, he freely admits that the biblical writers are not always true, are not always correct in what they say. Okay? That's, that's what he says. He freely admits that. And not only that, I call him, with some affection, because he's a nice guy, I call him Dr. Sex, because I've written five books, he's written seven books, but all of his seven books are on the same subject. Okay, they're all on sex, yeah. So you can see them on there. So, so, um, so the pseudepigrapha, I don't know if you know this. These are writings between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Actually, there are quite a few. 
I mean, I've got two volumes, two thick volumes of, of the writings from between the Old and the New Testament that aren't in our canon, right? Anyway, he read them all, and anything they had to do to a sex, he wrote a book about it, okay? Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Have you heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls before, right? They're, they're important, right? Well, he read all the Dead Sea Scrolls, and whatever they had to say about sex, not just same-sex activity, but whatever they had to write about sex, he, he wrote a book on that. So Philo, Josephus, have you heard of Philo, a Jewish philosopher out of Egypt, Josephus, historian, wrote a lot of stuff, right? He read through them all. Whatever they had to write about, say about sex, he wrote a book on that, right? I only had room for four. He has like two more or three more. And, and not surprisingly, he also wrote a book on what the New Testament says, okay? So, so what I'm trying to get you to hear is, I mean, I'm talking about a guy who's widely recognized among New Testament scholars as like the world's leading expert on views of sex and sexuality in the ancient world, okay? And I've also told you that he's not at all conservative, right? Now, notice what he's, I heard him say this. I was in Montreal when he gave this paper only a couple of summers ago. So he said, for those of us whose understanding of scriptural authority does not entail such belief. And this is the idea that the biblical writers were correct, right? And then he said this, which really caught my attention. He said, we can only stand and wonder at the, look at these words, extraordinary maneuvers which have been undertaken to reread Paul as not condemning homosexual relations at all. Do you see why that's such significant? He says, you know, those scholars out there who are trying to interpret Romans and 1 Corinthians 6, 9 in a way that Paul would accept, he, he calls that extraordinary maneuvers, yes. See, from his point of view, of course Paul was against same sex, but he just thinks Paul is wrong, and so therefore we shouldn't listen to him, okay? So again, if you think that I'm like ultra-conservative, distorting the evidence, I want you to hear this true liberal, and he's a pretty expert in the field, say exactly what I'm saying. Except, of course, I believe that Paul was true, and therefore we're under some obligation to take his words or God's word seriously. I've got one more kind of voice like that. His name is Lewis Crompton. And uh, he's not so much a biblical scholar, but he is widely recognized as a leading scholar on sexual issues. He's originally from Canada. You can see his book is published by Harvard Press, a very prestigious press. He himself is a gay man. And notice what he wrote in his big studies over the years. He said, some interpreters seek to mitigate, right, to soften Paul's harshness, have read the Romans passage as condemning not homosexuals generally, but only heterosexual men and women who experimented with homosexuality. According to this interpretation, Paul's words were not directed at a bona fide homosexuals in committed relationships. And now he's going to evaluate that interpretation. He says, but such a reading, however well-intentioned, right? I mean, he's sympathetic with what these scholars are trying to do. He says, they nevertheless seem strained and unhistorical. Nowhere does Paul or any Jewish writer of this period imply the least acceptance of same-sex relations under any circumstances. The idea that homosexuals might be redeemed by mutual devotion would have been wholly foreign to Paul or any Jew or early Christian. So remember, this is a gay scholar, right, uh, who, who would like you know, uh, biblical scholars to have a different interpretation of Paul, but he just, again, says, you know, I, I, that's not true. But he, he has more integrity, in a way, than some so-called Christian scholars because he just says that Paul was against same-sex activity, but he just thinks Paul was wrong and we shouldn't listen to him. So I'm giving you these two other voices, hoping that if you've dismissed what I've said earlier as maybe, you know, distorting the evidence that maybe you might hesitate a little quickly in making that judgment because actually these liberal scholars come to the same conclusion that I have presented to you this evening. So in some circles, and, and I, I, I feel the frustration that many lay Christians have because, you know, you, you say, some scholars say this about these texts, yet there are other scholars who say that. And if the scholars can't agree, well then, what? Either who am I or 
How can we make such a big, I mean, this is, this is a common argument. So I understand why people in the church, especially if you don't have access, you know, to some of the technical details that, that some of us have the privilege of doing so, would feel frustrated. So I want you to... I want you to hear me say this. So it's not like we've got like 50-50 or 60-40. It isn't. I mean, yes, there are two opposing interpretation of the biblical text. But it's not like an equal thing and, gee, we don't know. I put in italics three C words, actually four C words. I like alliteration, right? So if you look at the biblical text, right, in an appropriate way, you know what hermeneutics, that means following the principles, we're going to talk about that tomorrow, if you, if you would be privileged me with showing up, but they are clear, I would suggest to you those texts are clear, they're consistent, they agree with each other, and they're compelling. So yes, there is debate about the meaning of text, but no, it's not like 50-50, 60-40, I suggest to you, no, there are clear consistent, and compelling conclusions that could be reached. So if you're a revisionist, if you think the church should change its views on these Bible verses, what are the kind of two other arguments you might want to say? So you will help people say, uh, Paul did not know of any positive same-sex relationship. In other words, Paul had no model. He, he had no living, breathing example of a long-term, monogamous, same-sex relationship. And so, therefore, we ought to maybe interpret his words differently, right? Because he didn't have that model, he couldn't have thought about it, and, and if he did think about it, or if he did have that model, he would have been more tolerant of that. That's a claim that is often made. How do we respond to that? First one response, and then a second one. Even if I would concede that Paul did not know of any long-term monogamous same sex, I'm going to disagree with that in just a second, but just for the sake of argument, let's say, say to such a person, you're right. For the sake of argument, I'll agree with you that Paul never saw or knew of a monogamous long-term same-sex relationship. I would suggest to you, based on what Paul wrote, he would nevertheless still be against it. Why? For the two reasons we saw earlier. One, Paul would say people are acting against their what nature? Their created nature. And two, Paul would say it violates the Old Testament law, right? Remember the arsenikoitai going back to Leviticus. However, now, remember I just said I'm going to exceed for the sake of argument. Now I'm not going to exceed for the sake of argument. <laughs> because well, our culture and society have been talking about sexual matters for quite a bit lately. And so it's not surprising that not just Christians, but non-Christians, non-Christian egghead people, scholars, have been doing a lot of research on sexual matters, even in the ancient world. And actually, it's quite clear that in the ancient world, there were rather well-known, because they were written about, sometimes they involved even Roman emperors, who had long-term monogamous same-sex relationships. And so it really is not the case that well, was Paul a dummy or was he rel relatively educated? Which one? Well, he went, remember, he went to what school? He went to the Harvard School of... <laughs> Maybe he just hung out in the backwaters of Tarsus. Actually, Tarsus was a big major city, by the way, in the ancient world, right? No, he traveled all over the world, okay? And so it's entirely plausible, if not likely, that Paul knew maybe not firsthand, but he certainly would have heard about, he would have known stories of people who had an ongoing, long-term uh, monogamous relationship. I have the quote here. You can see from Compton, the, and also this book. See, that's an anthology, a source book, because there are lots of texts, non-Christian texts, that talk about all kinds of sexual activities, and, and so it really is not the case that Paul would have had no clue even of the existence of such a thing as a monogamous, long-term, same-sex relationship. One more, uh, one more argument you might meet, and then uh, we'll move on to a, a conclusion and a response. So another, another common claim is genetic causes, scientific explanations for same-sex attraction. Paul wouldn't have known about those things. And because Paul wouldn't have known about those things, we have to look at what he says about same-sex with some, you know, caution or restriction. Okay, that's a common claim. How do we respond? Well, um, I'll just say one thing, and I'll let Bernadette Broughton say the second thing. 
Yes, it is true, Paul wouldn't have known about a possible genetic cause of same-sex attraction. But it's not the case that in the ancient world, they had no idea that some people were, so to say, born that way. In fact, this scholar, Bernadette Broughton, who's still alive, she's a lesbian scholar. She's a leading lesbian scholar. She herself argues against this point. You can see here in italics, contrary to the view that the idea of sexual orientation did not develop until the 19th century, as if it was only in recent times that people suddenly said, hey, you know, people were born that way, or they had an orient... He, she says, the astrological sources, these are ancient writings having to do with the stars, okay, and they say some things about how they had impact on people, demonstrate the existence in the Roman world of the concept of a lifelong erotic orientation. So I deliberately picked a lesbian scholar because I don't want to be accused of distorting the evidence. So, so this is a lesbian New Testament scholar, an expert on um, on, uh, you know, gay and lesbian and transgender issues who disagrees with that argument that Paul and other biblical writers didn't know about a genetic cause and therefore we ought to interpret them differently. Well, I, I kind of fear that I'm getting to the saturation point and so we've got to wrap it up. So one big point and then I have the conclusion. Remember, I was going to end on, how are you going to know when I'm going to end when I start talking about what word? Grace, that's exactly right. I'm a little nervous, frankly, about this discussion. Okay, so, so if indeed I've suggested to you, I don't know if you agree, I've suggested to you that the texts are clear, consistent, and compelling. If they are, then the issue before us is not so much one of interpretation. Like we don't know what the Bible means, so that's not the issue. The issue really comes down to one of obedience, this is the 500th year of the Reformation, and uh, surely you know one of those five solas, sola scriptura, right? By the way, it doesn't mean we only listen to the Bible. We do listen to other sources. There are other authorities that help us understand life and so forth. But sola scriptura does mean that our ultimate authority, the ultimate authority, right, by which we make some evaluations and judgments is Scripture, and I said to you at the very beginning, um, I don't base my beliefs on my experiences. However powerful those experiences are. Oh man, are they ever powerful. Because I know gay people, right? You know gay people. Some of those gay people are your family members and you love them, right? And so those are hugely powerful experiences we have, right? And so I understand the attraction, Right? I mean, I understand the force pulling at us. And it really is powerful because it's enhanced. It's undergirded by society and culture, right? I mean, our society and culture is huge in this regard. I don't know about you, but I don't like to be accused of being a homophobic. I don't want to be accused of being an uncaring, unsympathetic person. That's not something that I enjoy, even though no matter how much I try to talk about grace in this subject, people still accuse me of such things. But again, my faith is not based on my experiences or my feelings. By the way, there are other things in the Bible that I don't like. I, you know, how about you? I mean, you know. I mean, the Bible says when people do nasty things to me, I'm supposed to what? I'm supposed to... I don't want to do that, do you? I mean, oh, that doesn't sound very fun, right? And, and the Bible says that I shouldn't be so concerned about money. You know, we live in a culture that's just all about money. I, there are lots of things in the Bible that I don't really like. I mean, I don't go, yay, you know, yeah. Okay. But yet again, my faith is not based on things I like or want to be true. My faith is ideally based on what the scriptures say. And, and so because the texts are, again, clear and compelling and consistent. Now, am I willing to submit to what the text say? Well, now I'm happy because the end is in sight because I see that word. I, I see that glorious word. I mean, I'm serious, right? I mean, uh, I, I'd rather talk to you about other things, you know, than what we're doing tonight, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk about grace, Okay. So the, the last word, you know, the, the last thoughts uh, that I want you to hear my voice speak about has to be about grace. And how does grace impact this discussion 
on same-sex activity and how we as individual Christians and as a communal body of believers, the church, deal with, with lesbians and homosexuals. So, so one is we ought to recognize the dignity of cel- celibacy. Wait a minute. <laughs> I mean, the church, the evangelical church, for a long time, maybe it never has said, but there's kind of like this quiet assumption that celibacy is weird or strange, okay, right? We, we've actually exalted marriage, you know. We, we, I might even say some places we've almost idolized it, okay? And uh, I just remind you that Jesus was married. <laughs> Got a problem with that, anybody? okay. <laughs> Okay, Jesus was single. He lived, a, he lived a celibate life. And in fact, he, he did have a couple of sayings. There weren't many, but there were a couple of verses. You know, he talked about the life to come, the kingdom to come, and, and, and marriage really wasn't a big deal. It wasn't maybe even a part of that kingdom to come. So yes, marriage is important, and I love my wife. Okay, you heard me? I love you, Bernice. There you go. You heard me, okay? I said it now three times, and I, okay? So, so I'm happy for, but, but I have to, I mean, I can't, that's the scripture is quite clear, right? I mean, uh, celibacy is really a, 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 a dignified, noble Christian virtue. My wife and I are thinking about our, our daughter. We have three daughters. The oldest two are married and the third one isn't. She's single. And she doesn't have an attraction for other women. She has attraction for other men. She would love to be... Married, that's right. But, but right now she has to live what kind of life? She has to live a celibate life. I mean, really, you know, it's, it's no different for her, right? It's no different for us either. Even, even married people have to live holy lives within their marriage, right? So all of us, you know, feel the consequences of the fall in our orientation and in our practice. All of us do. And yet we're called to live holy lives regardless of our situation, and for gay and lesbian brothers and sisters, for single brothers and sisters, right? Part of living a holy life is living a celibate life, and the church, instead of thinking that is inferior, we sometimes do that, right? Like, oh, it's too bad. About so, okay? We ought to encourage, we ought to affirm, and in fact, Paul will go one step further, by the way. You know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, he who refrains from marriage will do even better. Yeah, they're, they're actually above us married folks, okay, if you have the gift of singleness and are willing to live a celibate life. So I want, I want us as a, as a community of grace to, to maybe rethink that business of celibacy a little bit more. And then here comes the, the second and uh, really important point, and that is we ought to be a hospitable community. We ought to be a grace-filled community. The church too often drives same-sex orientated people away because it's already a burden for such brothers and sisters who have this orientation. That's a burden often. Uh, it's, it's a difficulty. And then when they are rejected by the church, you can surely understand there's a powerful attraction to go to a community that will accept them, right? I mean, all of us need acceptance. All of us need some form of fellowship. All of us need, you know, some, God created us, you know, not to live all alone in isolation, right? But to be, to be, to be, to be a community. And so, you know, the church needs to work hard at providing that kind of caring, compassionate community where not just our same-sex attracted brothers and sisters, not just our single brothers and sisters, but all, mar- I mean, all believers are encouraged and are put in an environment where they're equipped to live uh, a, a, a holy life in every aspect, including their sexual activity. So thank you so much for your patience and your attention. Um, I'm a little nervous, not because I regret anything I've said. I, I, I've, I feel that I've clearly and accurately conveyed to you what the New Testament texts say. But as I said at the beginning, there's a lot more to this issue. And I'm worried that you might draw conclusions about what I've said or maybe what I haven't said and uh, it seems to me that we have a little bit of time for some Q&A, and maybe 
you'll be confident enough. I know it's a big crowd and this might be a sensitive issue, but I'm willing to open the floor up and see if there's some questions you have that maybe I can answer. I prefer biblical questions, but there are other questions related to this that, that may be a benefit for others also to hear. So there's a mic or two. There is. There is? Okay. I know that's even more intimidating to speak into that mic, but um, we're all part of the same family, aren't we? These are brothers and sisters who are here, and, and hopefully that will uh, embolden you to uh, share something. And you don't have to ask a question. You can just say something. I'm happy not to have just to give contesting. an answer. All right, we got it. So. Thank you so much. Um, so what do you say to the person who says, you know, if God loves me, why did he make me this way and therefore condemn me to a life of, you know, what, whatever, all uh-huh. the torture and all that? So. So. So this raises the question about whether or not people were born gay, and then if they were born gay, whether you can say God made me this way, all right? So I, I think that, that, that God, by the way, God reveals himself in two ways, right? God reveals himself through the world, general revelation, and he reveals himself better and more clearly through the word, right? Special revelation. And I think that there's enough scientific evidence that some people... Now, we can debate how many. Some people have a genetic orientation from the time that they were born that they were gay. Although it's interesting, John Hopkins, does that sound like a reputable, okay? I, I, interesting, study of twins actually have, have said that it seems less high percentage than before. I find that kind of striking. But I think that we should concede that there are people who are, who are born gay who have a genetic orientation. However, I don't believe that such a person can say that God made them that way. Because I would like to suggest to them, I don't know if you'll agree, that God did not make us that way or this way. God made us a perfect way, right? A man and woman perfectly for each other. But then we have that nasty thing called the fall. And I said earlier, the fall has impacted all of life, all of created life. It's impacted everyone. It's impacted me as a heterosexual, right? And it's impacted other people as a homosexual or a lesbian, right? So I would argue that it's no different than you meet a person, let's say a a person who's born with Down syndrome. Okay, I don't think you would say that God made that person a Down syndrome. No, I would say, no, no, Down syndrome is a consequence of the fall, right? Okay? Does that sound... um, uh, I hope that's helpful. Now, some, some, some people don't accept that answer, but I would argue that, again, yes, people are born that way, but I wouldn't say that God made me that way. And if God didn't make me that way, well, then you can't say if he made me that way, then how would he make me that way if he wouldn't allow me to live that way? You see, I mean, that, that's the logic. And so I, I, just don't, I just don't find that that way. Let me give you one more example. Um, let me pick on alcoholism for a minute. Okay, there, there, there is a, a potential genetic cause of alcoholism. So if you have Native American or First People or Indians, okay, there's a high problem of alcoholism. If you have one parent who's an alcoholic, the child has a much greater impact by alcohol, right? If both parents are, okay? So let's imagine you're the child of alcoholics, all right? And you drink alcohol and... Not surprisingly, alcohol has a greater impact on you, right, because of the way you're genetic, than on that. And you go out and you drive and you kill somebody, right? You can't go to a court of law and say, well, I have a genetic disposition toward alcohol, and therefore I'm not responsible for my actions under, okay? No, because society says, well, no, no, you, you're still responsible to live within, okay? I don't, I don't know if that's a fair analogy. So I'm saying, wait a minute, all of us, whether we're, born heterosexual, homosexual, right? Okay. We still have a responsibility for how we act in our fallen nature, right? In our fallen nature, right? Thank you for being bold enough to break the ice and ask the first question. So now it'll be easy for the second person. Over here, yes. Um, so, just when you first uh, started talking about Jesus and the um, the silence, what people draw from his silence when he doesn't say anything about um, sexual immorality specific to homosexuality, I just noticed as we went forward and talked about some of um, Paul's writings that he does specifically mention it outside of sexual immorality. And I just wondered, 
um, kind of like the argument that people might have that, you know, with Jesus not saying anything, but then in Corinthians and in Timothy, uh, Paul does specifically say sexual immorality and men who have sex with other men. So he, he separates it even though they fall under each other. So are you saying um, Jesus should have done that too or something? Or, or, or he <laughs> yeah. didn't maybe? And, no, and I just mean something? like when people, people might take that if they like someone who listened to, you know, read exactly through this or listened um, yes. to your presentation here might say, you know, well, why didn't he? So what would be the response in that case? Well, um, one possible response is one that some of us know. Every passage should be read or interpreted in its context, okay? I did even a little bit of that when I, listed, when I read that list. In other words, I was a little concerned that we were talking so much about same-sex activity that we would, remember in that list of 1 Corinthians 6, 9, I said sexual moralities. I said there's a good reason why it's at the top of the list because of the context, you know, the sexual discussion. And I also hinted at the fact that Paul did not think specifically about same-sex activity when he was writing these passages, right? It's really an illustration of a point that he's trying to make, a passing illustration, all right? But the reason it's a passing illustration actually is because of the point I said earlier, because in the early church, <laughs> there was no real debate about same-sex activity, whether it was appropriate or not, right? And because no one was debating it, no one was asking about it, therefore Paul, not surprisingly, doesn't treat it in detail or head on. So, um, the other person may not find this so convincing, but I would just say, you know, if you look at that list and you look at the other list too, they, they are written not in a haphazard way, but they were written in that particular context. And so that's why Paul separated them out from each other. And I would concede again, as I just did to you, that Paul wasn't thinking specifically about it. But I also said to you, that doesn't mean we can say oh, he didn't care about it or wasn't unimportant or, right? So it, it, it's, it's easy to twist the scriptures around, you know, I mean, uh, Paul says, you know, Paul says to the Corinthians, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. You don't know that verse? Okay, all right, all right. But in Thessalonians, he says to the Thessalonians, when Jesus comes, who's going to be my victory crown? It's going to be you guys, right? Now, you could look at that and say, oh, Paul, he contradicts himself, right? In Corinthians, he says, you're not supposed to boast. You're only supposed to boast in the Lord. And yet in Thessalonians, he's going like, hey, you Thessalonians, I'm proud of you. In fact, oh, look at the good job I did. Okay, you see? It's easy to say that, right? However, if you look at it in context, you say, now, what's going on in Corinthians? Well, these are people who are spiritually, right? I mean, they're, they're overly proud of each other, right? Paul says to the Corinthians, what do you have that you did not receive? Did you, you can't, right? Name one spiritual gift that was not given to you, right? Yeah, you didn't earn it. It was given to you. And then the next verse is, well, if you did receive it, why do you boast as if it weren't? Okay. So, so in that letter, it makes perfect sense for him to say, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Thessalonians, there's none of that problem at all. And, and Paul, in fact, actually wants to reassure the Thessalonians that he loves them because he hasn't been able to go back. And actually there's a smear campaign about if he really loved you, he would have come back. Right. Okay. And so Paul, in order to convince the Thessalonians that he really does care about them, he says, you guys, I love you. I love you. I love you. In fact, I love you so much that when Jesus comes, I, I'm going to show off with you. You're going to be like my victory crown. I'm going to go, look at God. Look at these Thessalonians. Aren't they amazing? Okay. So, so in the context, all of that makes easy sense, right? Although, so lots of times, you know, people can twist or manipulate scripture and, and draw conclusions. That can easily be done. And that's why it's so important, little plug for tomorrow, that we'll talk about how to read the Bible for all it's worth, right? So you kind of watch out for these uh, dangers and you kind of treat the scriptures the appropriate way. Over here, sure. Going back to your explanation of homosexuality, and it's something I've struggled with in dealing with that, that you are born with that tendency. I can accept your explanation there as something to consider. However, this whole thing of, tra of, of, of the transgender now and the change, sexual change and all that, is that something that's been latent in this life for a period of time and all of a sudden it's presented itself? Or how do you explain that? Uh -huh. Well, I'm, I'm not an expert in this. And if I had time to do more research, especially in the medical area, right, it really is, a true, it really is true that there are some children who are born who are not 100% male, with male genitalia, right, or 
female, okay? That's, that's just a fact, okay? So there are complications with a small percentage of children when they are born in terms of their gender. Now, again, my answer is basically the same as I said to the sister a minute ago. I wouldn't say that God made them that way, right? I would, again, uh, I don't know if others would agree with that. I would say that's a consequence of the fall. That's part of the messiness of the world that we now live in, right? Uh, and that's why Paul says in Romans 8, right? Uh, he says it's not only Christians who are eager for Jesus to come again. It's even the creation itself. Oh, the creation is like a woman in labor, <laughs> right? Uh, again, I'm not going to offend women by pretending to know what labor is like. I did not say that, okay? But five times I've watched my wife in labor, and then I can assure you she was a lot happier after that baby came out, all right? And so Paul says that's the way creation is. I mean, that's part of the messiness of life, right? And, and um, when I was younger, you know, it was hard to pray, you know, amen, come Lord Jesus, you know, because as Martin Marty said, once Christians discovered heaven on earth, there was no need for them to look for it anywhere else. Did you hear that? There's some truth to that. But the longer you live, and I'm starting to live a little longer, right, you do see more of the messiness of life, the pain and sorrow of living in a broken, fallen world. And there's a lot of complications and pain and suffering from these kind of situations. And then it becomes easier to kind of eagerly look for Christ to come and, and to take all that what is wrong and make it right again. You know, that new heaven and that new earth. But we shouldn't dismiss. We shouldn't dismiss the transgender issue. I'm just saying, you know, you need to think a little bit carefully about those problems and then how can we, again, as a grace-based community, minister appropriately in those contexts. What about the person who is practicing the lifestyle and they would like to uh, come to church and worship? Um, church really doesn't know what to do with them. Um, I ask that question because my son is in that situation. Yes. And uh, I don't think Jesus taught us to clean up before we come. So how, how can the church show grace to this group of unreached people. Mm -hmm. So thank you for um, sharing that uh, personal question and that issue. So, so uh, during the break, uh, uh, a sister talked to me too about friends and family members too who are gay and whether to attend a wedding or something like that, right? It's somewhat related, right? How, how can we appropriately act in those situations? And the hard part, of course, is there's no explicit texts that deal with those things, right? So, um, so that means we should prepare ourselves to say that may not be an absolute this or that. There isn't a law that says, if this is the case, this is how you act. If this is the case, this is how you act. At best, we can find principles from Scripture, right, about proper moral conduct, and then we have to apply those principles in whatever context we find ourselves. And how do you do that? You need something that the Bible refers to as wisdom. And so uh, it requires us to be humble, and it requires us to pray to God to give us wisdom to know how to act in those particular situations. Now, the kind of questions we ask are, uh, how can, you know, if we do this, will this compromise our principle, right? Will this compromise our identity? Those are the kind of questions you ask, right? Um, I mean, how long can we, you know, how long can we accept a person who in a deliberate, consistent, persistent way continues in such, I mean, this is where there has to be some ambiguity and there's going to be some disagreement among brothers and sisters. But on the other hand, the scriptures are clear that persistent, deliberate, ongoing, right? I mean, you know, the church has to respond to that too. But we have to be careful. That isn't our go-to. It isn't our immediate reaction, right, that we slam judgment, right? So, so the question is, how can we be a accepting, caring community, right, but not compromise our principles? And it gets hard because someone pointed this out to me uh, the other week, and I thought it was a good point. We confuse love and acceptance, Love and acceptance. 
You see, there are many people from the revisionist point of view, especially those who are same-sex attracted, right? They want from us not really love. They want acceptance, you see. Because if you don't accept me, then you don't love me, you see. And that's where it gets tricky. So, Because I think it's possible to love someone, but not to, so to say, baptize or accept the behavior that they do. Now, of course, if the person... You can't control what they do, right? Then, then it can be kind of hard. But at least we can, as a Christian community, try to love them, right? And yet our principles, based on Scripture, do not allow us to accept that behavior, right? I'm trying, I, I know I'm sounding vague, but, you know, this is what I said to the sister earlier about should you go to a wedding or shouldn't you go to the wedding, right? And I mean, should you send a gift or shouldn't you send a gift, you know? And they're complicating factors, you know. Can you attend a wedding? What if you're a pastor like I am? Should you officiate at a wedding? I mean, some of these are clearer for me, yes and no, than others. But this is the kind of struggle that we have when we talk about wisdom. Do we have the wisdom to, on the one hand, act according to the principle of love? Here, you know, love the Lord your God and love your Neighbor as yourself. But you know what? The Beatles were not 100% right. All you need is... No, because, I mean, the Beatles were wrong. Because according to Second John, for example, or if you read Jude carefully, or even Paul says, speaking the what in love, speaking the truth. So, so you know, we have to be... You know, I know I'm just throwing some important big picture principles to keep in mind as we wrestle with those very particular situations. And um, we, we pray for wisdom to act in an appropriate way. And we also hope that the Christian community does not judge us, you know, for the decisions we make, maybe even sometimes when we get it wrong, right? There was a brother up here who looked really disappointed when Pastor Roger went right by him. He got all excited. He was ready to answer, and he instead went over here. So, <laughs> so I might have missed it or... But I was curious, when you were talking about how Paul and how he was thinking about when he was, how he knew the Old Testament backwards and forwards and everything, and so he was thinking about that when he was writing currently in Corinthians and Romans and all that, wouldn't, wouldn't it be more powerful to how it all lines up from the Old Testament to the New Testament if Paul didn't, just because he knew it, wouldn't it be more so impactful and powerful that it was the Holy Spirit writing through him, not him actually thinking about, okay, there was that verse back in the Old Testament, Leviticus, Leviticus, let me think about that and let me write that. Wouldn't it be more powerful to say that it is just truly, it was the Holy Spirit that just connected those dots versus Paul and his knowledge of connecting the dots okay. and kind of that. Um, so if I've understood your question correctly, you've raised a very interesting, a very important question that is not so much about the interpretation of Scripture, but another I word, the inspiration of Scripture, the inspiration of Scripture. And I don't know how much you've thought about how did it work? How did God inspire the biblical writers to write what they did? And it seems as if, okay, the, um, the Holy Spirit, it was not like the invasion of the body snatchers, right? It wasn't like, zoom, you know what I mean? And they were taken over by the Holy Spirit in a robotic way, okay? I mean, that could have happened. I mean, God was certainly capable of doing that. But, but seemingly, God, re, you know, in our circles, we use a word called, not a dictation view of inspiration. You know, we're dictated word for word and, and every, you know, makes no difference whether you're listening to Paul or to Jesus. You know, it makes no difference whether you're listening to Amos or to Isaiah. It's all the Holy Spirit, okay? Instead, God in his sovereignty fully worked through the biblical writers. They retained their own human personality and character. They were real historical people who lived in a real historical time. And yet somehow, mysteriously, you know, mysteriously, you know, God was working through that, all right? So in other words, Amos, you know, who's wearing the, the, the you know, the overalls, and the rubber boots, because he's like the country farmer from Tekoa, right? He actually speaks a little different than Isaiah, who hangs out with the bigwigs in the courts of the king, right? And, and Paul, you know, Paul can, you know, the personality of Paul comes up pretty strong. That's why some people I've met don't like Paul. He can say to the Galatians, oh, what, oh foolish Galatians. Oh, and the people pushing circumcision, I hope they go all the way and castrate themselves. 
don't laugh. I mean, that's what he says. <laughs> okay, he does. He, you know, might say emasculate yourself or something like that. In your, so, so again, so I think we have to wrestle with the question, you know, how can Scripture be fully the Word of God and yet also fully the Word of man? So, so it, I don't know if it would be better or if it were that way or, or not. I, why, why wouldn't you say that the Holy Spirit was working in and through Paul and Paul was so formed and shaped. Again, God was at work in his life. God opened doors for him to have that solid Jewish training. And, and, and Jesus met him and, you know, talk about a paradigm shift. Like, whoa, all right, okay. I mean, whoa, right? And so here's this, this passionate, well-trained guy, you know, who's super gifted at especially understanding how to explain the gospel to Jews because he himself was a Jew. So I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I would buy that that would be a better way or not. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. To me, it's still amazing, you know, that, that God worked through Paul. And, and, and Paul, again, sometimes he conscious, especially when he quotes word for word, then he definitely is quoting consciously the Old Testament. I'm also raising the possibility that maybe you've met some, like, really amazing Christians who are so steeped in the Bible that when they pray, it's like they pray Bible verses. Have you heard people like that? I mean, there are some, right? I mean, little, I don't even know if they, that's just who they are. I mean, is it so crazy to believe that Paul was like that too, right? I hope that. But you raised a very interesting question that we could spend some more time on, and, and that is, again, yeah, how, can, how did that work? How did God work through the human writers and yet still in such a way that, you know, that Scripture is the Word of God and has, therefore, the authority of, of the Word of God? Dr. It was Lyle. over here, and uh, maybe we have to... By the way, my motto is, the longer I am, the better I better be. <laughs> okay, you catch? Okay. The longer I am, the... And I'm not sure, I'm not sure how good I'm going to be, so we're going to wrap this up pretty soon, okay? So, and uh, by the way, while I have a chance, you know, I, I did something dangerous on that first slide, right? There's my email address. Did you see that there? Okay, <laughs> right? And so if you... Uh, didn't get a chance to ask your question, or you were nervous about asking your question, or maybe I said something that ticked you off. Maybe I just said it bad. Sometimes I do that. You know, my brain doesn't work always in sync with my mouth. And so you have an opportunity to, to contact me. And, you know, so don't forget about that. But finally here, maybe the last question, yes, or comment? Uh, I've, got, I've got a statement and a question. I want to make sure that I'm thinking correctly. Uh, when people have said to me in conversation, well, you know, Jesus didn't say, he didn't come out and say, he was opposed to homosexuality. Well, he actually, he actually did. Uh, and let me just, you being a scholar, make sure that I'm, that I'm using you to, to um, um, validate, make sure I'm on the right point. Because Jesus said, I didn't come to uh, do away with any of the law, but I'm the fulfillment of the law. Well, then you go back to both De Deuteronomy and Levit Leviticus, where it, homosexuality is definitely you know, dealt with in a very clear manner. So Jesus did, and is that correct? Is that a good line of thinking? Um, I think, and, that's, yet, and yet, still being compassionate to the person you're talking to. It's it's a point to think about. That's exactly right. Although you see, um, the revisionists, those from the other side, will say, "Well, what about those other Old Testament laws about clothes to wear and you know eating certain kind of meat and so forth?" You see, and so so you can make the point, but sometimes you know someone could take that argument and and complicate it, and that's Except why this is more important than what, clothing. It, I, okay, <laughs> and it also involves whether and this is by the way, this is a point. It makes a difference whether an Old Testament text or law is quoted again or affirmed in the New Testament. Some of us talk about reading the Old Testament through New Testament eyes or reading the Old Testament Christologically and so forth. And that's another complicated discussion about what's the relationship between the Old Testament or the Old Covenant and the New. But can we say that Jesus, because he refers to himself as fulfilling the law, that that's a causal link just, you know, because people like the fellow that you showed in the slide that said Jesus didn't say anything about the, the subject. In fact, he does because of saying he's the fulfillment of the law. Is that correct? Well, I, I think that it's, a, it's an argument uh, or a point that you can raise, but it's weaker. It's lower than some of the other points, you know. And so we begin with clear text, which dear, you know, clearly deal with it, and then we move down the pecking order, right? We maybe okay. refer to that plural sexual moralities, and yeah. then we might make some other observations as well. I think this is, I think I'd like to say this as my last point. Well, maybe not the last point, but almost the last point. There is a difference. I always teach students between shouting and whispering. And by the way, when I say shouting and whispering, I don't mean decibel levels. 
I mean in terms of certainty and so forth, right? So I'm going to start off by saying this. There are many subjects that the Bible teaches in many places. And in those many places, those texts are very clear, and therefore these are the teachings, these are the ideas that we should shout. Okay? No one disagrees with that. I'm setting you up for the other half. The other half is there are some topics that the Bible does not address very often, and in the few times it talks about it, it's not very clear, and these are the things we should whisper. Yes. In other words... We avoid the temptation, you know, the joke about ministers, you know, they have your sermon manuscript and you're right in the margin, weak point, shout louder, you know, right, okay? So, so um, in other words, I want you to know that I'm well aware of the difference between shouting and whispering. And there are some subjects where I feel the need to whisper, not because I'm wishy-washy, but because the text doesn't give me the grounds to shout, you follow me? And um, I'm saying that because, notice what I said about the text on same-sex activity. I said that they were what? They were clear, consistent, and compelling. So I know the difference between shouting and whispering. And, and even though I know the difference, and I'm willing to sh- say whisper if that's what Scripture relies, right? It seems to me that on this particular subject, the Scriptures are clear enough that I feel confident going into the lion's den of a Baptist church as a Reformed person, you know, and speaking about a very sensitive subject. So I think our time should come to a close. I do, again, uh, thank you for the privilege of your time and attention. And I was serious about if you have a question or comment, uh, uh, tonight maybe isn't the best time to do so. But if you feel strongly enough about it, then you'll look at that email address and write to me, and I promise you I'll write you back, all right? And if you uh, are so inclined, maybe you'll want to join us tomorrow because, uh, uh, you know, how to read the Bible for all it's worth uh, is really an important discussion so that when we face complicated issues over which Christians argue about the meaning of Scripture, the things we're talking about tomorrow are, are really important. But I'd like to bring our time to a close. Pastor Roger, can I invite people to stand and close in prayer and we're dismissed, or is there something you want to say yet? Uh, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we recognize that the subject that we've been reflecting on this evening is indeed a uh, sensitive one, not just within our culture and society, but also within the church among your people. And we do acknowledge the pain, the messiness that is often associated with this topic. It involves not just a subject out there, but people near and dear to us. And so we pray, on the one hand, for an understanding of your will, for a knowledge of the truth as it is revealed in Scripture, but we also pray for the conviction of love, and we now pray for wisdom that is not our own, but wisdom to speak, but also to act in love, to make sure that despite the pressures of culture and society, despite the temptations of our experiences and desires that we will so act in a way that we honor both the truthfulness and the beauty, the grace of the gospel. I thank you for those gathered here this evening and pray that you'll bless each one in their individual walk with you, that you'll send us on our homeward way through the power and presence of your Holy Spirit and that you'll equip us to live lives that bring glory and honor to you. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus, and we all say, amen. Amen. Go in peace.